Welcome everyone um, to BGSF's second CPE webinar. When we sent out the evaluation after our first webinar, several of our attendees uh, requested that cryptocurrency would be a topic of interest. So we are thrilled that our friends at Weaver agreed to be our guest speakers today. My name is Kay Steelman, uh, the VP of Professional Services for the Accounting and Finance Brands of BGSF and the administrator of our CPE programs. So next slide, Brittany. So I have some reminders for everyone today. To earn one hour of CPE credit, you will need to attend for at least 50 minutes. We will go for an hour from noon to one. Uh, and our platform does keep track of when you log on and when you log off. So just make sure you are on uh, for at least 50 minutes and that you answer three of the four polling questions. And those will come up randomly during the presentation. So you can uh, only respond to the polling questions. We learned last time uh, if you are logged in through a desktop app or a mobile app, such as Zoom Cloud Meetings, Apple, or Google Play. Uh, if you're just trying to dial in on your phone, uh, you won't have access to the polling questions. So within one week of your completing the evaluation form, we will send you your CPE certificate. So if you have any questions, uh, please enter them directly in the chat section to the side. And our marketing specialist, Brittany, will be uh, monitoring that and compiling those. And we will answer some of those during the presentation since we have four speakers today. Uh, when one speaker finishes, they'll try to answer a few of those um, in the chat section. Uh, but for those that we don't get to, we will get to those at the end of the presentation. So next slide, Brittany. So just a little bit about BGSF. We are one of the fastest growing public, publicly traded uh, workforce solution firms in the United States. And the company was created in 2007, formerly BG Staffing Inc. and now operates through 91 locations across 46 states, the District of Columbia, and now we are in Canada. So within our professional division, BGSF has 10 specialized brands. We've grown through acquisition and we acquire companies that are very specialized and they're specific to accounting and finance, HR, legal and administrative, information technology, and cybersecurity. In fact, our next webinar will actually be on cybersecurity. And so look out for more information uh, on that. I think the date will be October 27th, if you want to kind of save the date. So our motto is your future, our purpose. So our purpose first approach, you know, connects the right talent to the right opportunities, whether your organization needs project consulting, staff augmentation, uh, direct hire or executive search services. So next slide. And so now a little bit about Weaver. Weaver is a top 35 national CPA firm with capabilities uh, far beyond the traditional assurance and tax services. So they have a philosophy of always uh, doing more than expected. And Weaver uh, formed a cryptocurrency task force to identify the evolving needs of the digital asset community, including investment funds, financial institutions, and blockchain companies. So to support those needs through a wide uh, array of services, uh, that includes risk advisory, IT advisory, financial advisory, audit, and tax. Uh, Weaver also serves clients across a wide variety of industries, including large public, private, national, and international organizations, as well as government and not-for-profit entities. Next slide. So I wanna introduce just briefly our presenters today. We are gonna have Becky Reeder, who's the partner in charge of Alternative Investment Services. And in a minute, we're gonna have Ari Elfenstein kick us off and he is Senior Manager of Risk Advisory Services. And also Tim Savage, uh, who is Senior Manager of Tax Services. And Tim made sure that we did this webinar after the 15th this month, because Tim had a huge, huge deadlines on the 15th. Uh, so Brett Neighbors is also going to be speaking, and he is the partner of the IT Advisory Services. So next slide. All right, so now it's my pleasure to kick this off to Ari to get us started. Thanks, Ari. Thanks, Kate. 
And um, I get a sense that a lot of our attendees are in 2021 familiar or have heard the terms blockchain and cryptocurrency. So just as a brief overview, we'll, we'll go through these terms and a few other terms that, that we'll be hearing uh, quite a bit over the next uh, 55 minutes or so. So what is blockchain? Uh, essentially, blockchain is a database structure or protocol that organizes the data into chronic chronologically sequenced blocks. The blocks are generated at a predetermined interval. Um, some projects will generate those blocks every two minutes, three minutes, six minutes, really dependent on how much data you want in each block. And the blocks are added to the chain using complex encryption that requires a large amount of processing. Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit louder here. Um, the blocks are added to the chain uh, using a large amount of processing power, which is provided by computers that are connected to this network that's specific to that blockchain. So in most cases, each computer that's connected to the network has the full blockchain uh, locally stored. And that is how we get the attributes that are, that are listed there, decentralization, immutability, neutrality. As a new block is added, the network confirms the authenticity of that block and every preceding block. The beneficial applications to the financial industry are, are pretty direct and, and easy to identify. Blockchain data is inherently ordered chronologically, which makes it easier to search larger data sets. And the need for duplication of information is in theory eliminated as each block has a unique identifier. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm on the uh, cryptocurrency slide, please. Thank you. And uh, so what is cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency is a type of digital asset that typically functions as a currency. Like with most of the terms that we'll hear, there's, there's no tricks in the naming. You know, the naming contains really what the purpose of uh, the descriptor of the term is. So uh, with that in mind, not every digital crypto asset is meant to be used as a currency. And uh, we'll get into use cases a little bit further further on in the presentation, but an example of that would be with Ethereum, which is the second largest blockchain project. Ethereum is, the use case for Ethereum itself is to pay for transactions that are occurring on the Ethereum network. Ari, we have uh -huh. to get to the first polling question. Um, so I'm going to officially push that up. I know everyone's answering in the chat, but I'm going to officially launch the poll now. Thank you. You can keep going, Ari. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering if there was a delay here. So um, moving on to what gives cryptocurrency value. Uh, there are many cryptocurrency enthusiasts that would like to spend hours debating the answer to this question. But taking a holistic approach here in 2021, it's, it's reasonable to say that a, a cryptocurrency's value is, is really coming from speculative market trading. And of course, that will, that will change as, as time goes on and, and the space matures. So an example of that, um, a perfectly timed example of that is, is how we saw the crypto market react similar to how global equities did uh, in response to, to the Evergrande story uh, out of China. Uh, can, uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, some key distinctions in terms uh, we have Bitcoin, obviously, is the, the original and largest cryptocurrency, and uh, that was launched in 2009. It's, it's really, it really comes down to dominance because it started in 2009. Uh, it, has, it has that dominant position within the cryptocurrency market. Uh, the term altcoin is, is simply uh, alternative coin, which really just describes any currency or any project that or any cryptocurrency associated with a project that came after Bitcoin. So again, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward there. Um, some terms that we've seen more so 
uh, with this recent um, spike in interest in cryptocurrency relative to back in 2017, we've heard terms like decentralized applications or, or dApps, centralized finance or DeFi. And these really just map to the use of smart contracts. So a decentralized app is simply a, a project or an app that is designed to run on a blockchain network rather than through a traditional provider like Amazon Web Services or Google. And uh, similar to with decentralized finance too, these projects will use smart contracts as a basis for executing uh, transactions automatically. Great, I see the, uh, the polling results here with uh, the majority of people having a, a basic understanding of, of cryptocurrency. All right, and next slide, please. All right, and so we will uh, move up, moving over to regulations, compliance, regulatory compliance. You can go to the next slide. We have at the federal level, four uh, regulatory agencies that have uh, an interest in, in the space and who have asserted jurisdiction over one or several uh, components, whether that be blockchain projects or, or cryptocurrency themselves. What we'll find is that overall regulatory bodies are comfortable with the idea of blockchain, but cryptocurrency kind of gives them some heartburn and they, they want to understand what the use case is for the cryptocurrency. Is it actually intended to be used as uh, a substitute for the US dollar or is it intended to be used as a utility token, uh, a currency that's used for going back to the Ethereum example, currency that's used to enable transactions on the Ethereum network. So starting off with the CFTC um, back in 2015, they asserted their determination that virtual currencies, such as Bitcoins are commodities under the Commodity Exchange Act. And they've also asserted the extension of their jurisdiction over fraud and uh, manipulation within stop, uh, spot markets, which they have um, over equities. Prior to this, they extended that to cover spot trading and manipulation that's, that occurs within cryptocurrency trading. So going back to a couple of slides to the term DeFi or decentralized finance, we can definitely look towards the F or CFTC to be involved in the direction and speed of growth for uh, projects that are developing under that, under that use case or with that objective. Uh, we have the Department of Justice, uh, which is involved in any matters related to federal criminal law. They partner with FinCEN, uh, which is a bureau under the Department of Treasury, where we see a lot of the requirements that we're familiar with under the Bank Secrecy Act as far as the reporting of suspicious activity. And that, you know, what we've seen recently is, or relatively recently is, is that regulators are accepting or comfortable with the existing framework that exists. Uh, they're comfortable with it being adequate right now to monitor for um, criminal use or you know, criminal activities or you know, tax evasion, things of that nature. So moving over to the Security and Exchange Commission, Commission the main touch point here uh, is SEC, the Howey, where more commonly referred to as the Howey test we have the investment of money in a common enterprise with the reasonable expectation for profits to be derived from the efforts of others. That is the basis for uh, determinations made regarding new cryptocurrency projects or new blockchain projects. Also circling back to the idea of a virtual currency versus utility token, what is, what is the coin being used for? Next slide, please. And at the state level, of course, we've had the, the state of New York um, provide some opinions and requirements. We have the, the bit license requirement. And, um, you know, closer to home here in Texas, I think the Texas Department of Banking has, has been 
early in stating its support in the overall concept of blockchain innovation and also publishing guidance on expectations regarding the extension of internal controls expectations on virtual currency based or blockchain based projects and the offering of banking services to those projects. Um, next slide, please. So just kind of wrapping up on, on regulatory compliance, the regulatory focus for businesses, they're monitoring for fraud. Are you raising funds? Are you offering a proprietary coin? You know, you know, a Dallas coin, are you offering Dallas coin and just collecting the funds and then vanishing? You know, obviously they're, they're gonna to want to prosecute that. Um, is it simply a matter of determining the need for registration? Um, really it's, it's, again, it's circling back to, to the use of the virtual currency itself. Um, at the consumer level, uh, we have income tax, tax reporting implications, which Tim is gonna get into later on in our presentation. Uh, but the main focus on the consumer side uh, would be the, the reporting of suspicious activity, uh, which is you know, nothing new. These BSA requirements have been, have been in effect in some form for, for well over a decade now. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And so when we're asking, you know, who has jurisdiction, it really comes down to what is the blockchain's purpose? What is the use case for the cryptocurrency? Is it intended to be used as a substitute for the US dollar like Bitcoin was? Or is it more like Ethereum, um, a currency that's used for you know, uh, transactions or proprietary use on, on that network? And then we have the question of geography, which is, that's the tricky one, you know, because these networks are, uh, you know, these decentralized networks are, they have nodes or computers located across the planet. So um, those are the initial questions that you wanna ask. And the general posture, as I touched on earlier, is, is really that as of now, regulators are comfortable that the existing regulatory framework that uh, that, that leverages the jurisdiction from these different agencies is adequate to detect the criminal activity and fraud without stifling the, the true technological innovation that, that blockchain is enabling to continue. So yeah. the, the story is developing and, and Congress and regulators are, are meeting at least a couple times a year to, to discuss the need for any sort of updates. So we will uh, do our best to keep you updated on that. And that wraps up my portion of, of the presentation. If we have any questions, I see, I see the question from Nas. Um, can you explain the difference between cryptocurrency and utility token? Um, cryptocurrency, again, the intention would be as a substitute for the uh, for US dollar or Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin is the right example, the original cryptocurrency. This is intended to be used to pay for things right off the bat in 2009. And so again, Ethereum, we have other projects, like Cardano and um, some other major ones based in the US, at least I can speak to those. Those are more utility tokens. And initially there were some concerns that the use, the term utility token was being applied to projects that were intended or being designed to be used as cryptocurrencies and, and, the, and the companies were self-applying the term utility token as a, as a workaround to, to kind of, you know, circumvent some, some registration requirements, but, but that's been addressed here. And the overall stance is that you look towards um, what is being done within the courts. You know, it's not so much that regula regulatory bodies are providing, you know, they're passing laws, but they are enforcing the jurisdiction that already exists. Uh, from a private equity standpoint, uh, I think Becky is gonna be getting into that. So if I can, if I can hold off on that, you know, if, if we don't answer the question there, we can 
hopefully circle back to it with our remaining time. Well, Ari, we'll move forward and do questions at the end. Um, so we'll we'll move on to the next section just because we've got four four parts. So. Uh, okay. Um, do do we want to move on here, or I can look at some of these other questions if you'd like. All right. Um, well, thanks, Ari. Um, Brittany, if you would move to the next slide, please. We'll go ahead and get started with accounting and reporting considerations. Um, so my name is Becky Reeder. Thanks for having us here today. We're excited to talk about this um, new and exciting technology that's come out recently. Um, and my section today is going to cover accounting and financial reporting considerations. Um, so there are some things that, that um, we definitely need to talk about um, related to this. To answer the private equity question, um, I'll just kind of start it off with that, and then we'll launch a polling question. Um, but so in the investment funds world, um, which is kind of where I live and, and where my practice is focused, um, we've seen most activity um, from either hedge funds um, or in the VC space. So we haven't seen a whole lot of activity in the private equity side yet. Um, and I think that that is primarily due to, you know, the uncertainties and the risks related to the this technology and just how new it is. Um, we're definitely seeing more in the VC side of things as, you know, more institutional money is coming into some of these VC funds that are being created to invest in this new technology. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of different applications of that, whether it's DeFi um, or other, you know, utilizations of blockchain technology. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell what we've been seeing um, on the hedge side, we have been seeing fund formations related specifically to trading in cryptocurrencies. Um, we've been seeing um, some funds investing in liquidity pools. Um, we've been seeing some funds investing in the DeFi space. So it's kind of all over the board in terms of what we've been seeing. But like I said, it's mostly been in the hedge and the VC rather than um, the private equity space at this point. So, um, Brittany, um, if you would mind launching, um, go to the next slide and launch that poll question, please. Um, in what way do you most expect to utilize cryptocurrency in your business? Um, so just want to get a pulse here on what you all are seeing and if you've actually experienced um, the use of cryptocurrency in your business thus far, or if it's something that you might be anticipating utilizing in the future, um, whether it's for payment of products or services, or maybe it's in a different form, or maybe you don't really see a utility for cryptocurrency at all um, in the near future. So we'd, we'd love to get your feedback on that. So we'll just give a, a minute or two here for you guys to answer that polling question. Um, and while we're waiting um, to get the results there, um, go ahead go ahead and kind of dive into the financial reporting aspects here of cryptocurrency. And so I think, you know, one of the most important things to first establish here is how does the FASB and the AICPA um, define cryptocurrency? And so that's really going to be the driving factor behind um, the accounting and the financial reporting for cryptocurrency. Um, so there's actually no current guidance as of yet in the accounting standards codification. Um, so the FASB has not um, gotten to that point yet, but they have issued and the AICPA has issued a practice aid on accounting for digital assets. It is not authoritative, um, but it is the best thing that we have at this point uh, when it comes to um, guidance on accounting for this stuff. So as, you know, Ari was mention, mentioning in the regulatory front, um, you know, things are evolving and changing constantly. And so, you know, you'll notice that too in the, with the financial reporting aspect of it. You know, this is all very new technology, even though it's been around for years now, um, it really hasn't come into the mainstream until probably the last, you know, year to two years. Um, and so, um, you know, we're just, we're seeing a lot of activity in this space, space now. And so, um, we'll just have, kind of have to see where that goes from here. And I think the regulators and the standard setters are really trying to catch up and figure out, um, you know, just how to get a handle on this stuff. So 
Based on the polling here, um, it looks like most of you, in fact, 60%, um, have said that you expect no anticipated use of cryptocurrency in the near future. So that's really interesting to me. Um, so I'm kind of surprised by that result. I thought there may be um, more folks who, who may um, be utilizing this in their businesses, but um, perhaps we're not quite there yet. So we do have 18 or 14%, um, it looks like, um, who are planning to use it or have been using it either for mining um, or you know, just purchasing crypto for an investment purpose. Um, and then accepting it as a form of payment for products or services. So very interesting result. Um, thanks, Brittany. You can go ahead and close that one out. Um, so just talking through what the AICPA has come out and said um, with their position on defining cryptocurrency, they have basically said, okay, so it is not cash and cash equivalents. It is not a financial instrument. It is not inventory. Um, it is not a commodity. And this is, remember, this is for financial reporting purposes. Um, there are different standards in place um, in other you know, regulatory considerations. Um, and they've said it's not a foreign currency. So what does that leave us with? Um, well, they have said that it meets the criteria of an intangible asset or it best satisfies the criteria of an intangible asset. And the reason for this is that U.S. GAAP defines an intangible asset as one that lacks physical substance and is not a financial asset. So we know that cryptocurrency is not a physical asset. It's not something you can touch or feel or hold on to. It is a digital asset. Um, so it lacks that physical substance. It's not a financial asset. So it didn't meet any of the criteria and we don't have time to go into all the detail about why it doesn't meet the criteria, um, but it doesn't meet the criteria to be classified as a financial asset. And so therefore their stance is that cryptocurrency should be accounted for and reported as an intangible asset. And based on that guidance, um, it would be considered, so you've got, you've got definite life intangible assets and you've got um, indefinite life intangible assets. And because there is no inherent limit on the useful life of cryptocurrency, it would be considered an indefinite life intangible asset. So Brittany, next slide, please. So knowing that the AICPA considers crypto to be an intangible asset, um, the way in which that gets recorded is like you would any other intangible asset. So upon acquisition, it becomes recorded at cost. And then it is um, evaluated for impairment. So um, typically the impairment analysis calculation is done annually, but it could also be done upon a triggering event. Um, and so, you know, this accounts for any significant declines in the value of crypto compared to the dollar. But once you mark it down under intangible asset guidance, you are not allowed to mark it back up. Um, so once you've written it down, you've taken an impairment on it, you've got to hold it at that, at that value. Um, and then also looking at the sale of goods and services. So um, if you are um, receiving cryptocurrency as a form of payment for a sale of your goods or services within your business, this particular transaction would fall under the guidance in ASC 606. And so under that guidance, you would be measuring um, that non-cash consideration, which in this case would be the cryptocurrency, at fair value at the contract inception. Um, and any changes in that fair value of the non-cash consideration after the contract inception, it does not affect the transaction price for the revenue contract. Um, so next slide, please. This slide really just goes through the accounting for um, whenever you do, um, um, whenever there is a sale of the cryptocurrency, whether it's to a customer or a non-customer, and there's guidance in this AICPA guide that indicates how that should be recorded. 
So we won't go into a lot of detail here today, but um, just to let you know that that guidance is included in that particular um, document. Next slide. Um, and fair value considerations here related to cryptocurrency, a couple things to consider are going to be the principal market, um, so as we know with the crypto markets, there's a number of different exchanges that you can utilize depending on um, the, the tokens that you are interested in. And so when you're looking at these from a fair value standpoint, um, you want to make sure to establish that principal market. Um, and there are several challenges associated with the cryptocurrency markets, one of them being that these markets are, are open all the time, unlike the New York Stock Exchange or other uh, traditional um, public markets, the cryptocurrency markets don't have a close. And so you will have to establish a policy for determining that cutoff time for fair value. Next slide. And in this ASCPA um, practice aid, there's also guidance in here regarding the presentation and relevant disclosures um, that are related to cryptocurrency and accounting for these as intangible assets. Um, so we don't have time to go into the details today, um, but there are um, some, some guidance in, the, in there that will um, help determine how to properly present and um, show those disclosures. Next slide. And a few other things I just wanted to mention. Um, so today we've talked about accounting for cryptocurrencies under the intangible asset guidance. However, uh, just be aware that if you are reporting as an investment company under topic 946, that guidance is different and it still follows the fair value treatment. Um, cryptocurrencies are going to be considered an investment and you would initially record them at fair value and subsequently measure them at fair value at each financial reporting date, similar to the way that you would uh, with any other investment that you're holding in a topic 946 investment company. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention is, you know, in accounting for these cryptocurrencies, um, you know, it's just really important to make sure that you're establishing detailed records of all the transactions that you are entering into um, with these cryptocurrencies. Um, from an audit standpoint, you know, we're going to be looking at, you know, what evidence do you have that you actually um, have rights to these cryptocurrencies that you can um, show us that these exist and that you actually have control over um, the transactions um, related to cryptocurrencies. And along with that, it's going to be really important to establish key controls um, regarding initiation of transactions, access and control of the private keys um, that allow you to access and transact with the cryptocurrencies. Um, and then you also need to consider the controls at the service providers, um, such as the custodians um, that may have custody um, of those, those tokens. Next slide. And so just final thoughts here, you know, cryptocurrency is becoming more and more mainstream. So, um, and it's very complex, you know, as you'll see um, with all of our presentations today, um, there's just a lot of changing guidance out there. We're constantly monitoring the space um, to make sure that we're up to date as far as the most recent legal and um, accounting requirements and, and regulatory requirements. So um, the resource that I mentioned today was the AICPA and the SEMA accounting for an auditing of digital assets practice aid. Um, so if you do have to account for a report on cryptocurrency, I would strongly recommend um, that you take a look at that guide. So. Thanks very much. There's so much more that we could cover, um, but I hope this gave you a great overview. Thanks very much. Over to you, Tim. Okay, so moving on to the most exciting topic of the day, and that is taxation. I mean, there's just nothing better, right? Um, well, jumping right into it, as the slide suggests here, how does the IRS view cryptocurrency um, if we actually go now to the next slide, this is a polling question asking exactly that. How does IRS view a transaction involving cryptocurrency? Have your answers here. And we will see the results. All right, so 
you hopefully you probably already answered, but if you have not, here is the answer. Um, it is straight from the IRS. Uh, this quote here on the left, virtual currency transactions are taxable by law, just like transactions in any other property. So the key word there being property, um, it was the third answer, I believe C um, in your polling question. And so now knowing it's taxes property that carries its own set of tax regulations. We'll talk about that. Um, and as you can see here on the slide, uh, here is our guidance from the IRS. There's not a whole lot out there. I'm not gonna bore everyone with all this guidance and all the tax regulations, but what I want you to take away from this is that back in 2014, uh, again, cryptocurrency kind of emerged in 2009, um, and then it took really five years for the IRS to establish a position. Again, in 2014 was the first time the IRS actually created a position, um, and, and they had a big discussion and a long FAQ in this IRS notice, and ultimately arrived at we are going to tax cryptocurrency and virtual currencies as property. Then in 2019, five more years, um, they basically reinforced that position as um, taxing cryptocurrency as property. And we have our poll results here. So about half of the participants um, got it right, tax as property. Um, and it is not taxed as physical currency. If it was, that would have a very different uh, treatment for tax purposes. Um, but then looking at IRS publication 544 here, uh, this governs how taxation of, of property um, when it's disposed, um, how that works. And there's a brief discussion of virtual currency in this publication. So again, there's not a whole lot of regulation. Uh, as Becky mentioned, it's constantly evolving, but we do know that the IRS likes to move at a snail's pace. Um, and hopefully we do get better regulations uh, here in the, in the next few years or so. But this is what we have to work with um, and, and kind of drives the conversation for taxation. So next slide. Again, don't wanna bore everyone here with um, all the code sections and regulations, but the two big ones I wanna point out are section 1001 and section 1221. So knowing that cryptocurrency, virtual currency, it's taxed as property, uh, 1001 governs how do you calculate a gain or loss when you dispose of property um, or with a cryptocurrency when you exchange that cryptocurrency. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward. Basically the value of what you're receiving, uh, the fair market value minus your basis in the asset is gonna trigger either a gain or loss. And then we're gonna look at that gain or loss and see if it's ordinary or capital in nature. And that's where we look to section 1221, which defines a capital asset. For the vast majority of people who, who are involved or invested in cryptocurrencies, um, it will be capital assets, capital property for you, meaning that um, when you exchange or make a sale or disposition, um, it, it will be sh either short-term or long-term capital. And uh, as we all hopefully know, a long-term capital gain is very beneficial. There's preferential tax rates for everyone. And um, the one exception I want to point out is that if you start a business and that business ordinary course of business is to generate income specific to virtual currencies, that actually might be ordinary in nature and not capital. We'll talk about that more here in a second, but big takeaway is uh, gain or losses is taxes property. So next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna break it down here and do two different sections. So tax considerations for individuals and then also considerations for businesses. So next slide. So tax compliance for individuals, um, it can be a very uh, burdensome task if you are very involved in cryptocurrency or it could be very simple if you are, are minimally involved. But what the IRS wants you to do is to keep consistent accurate records of any cryptocurrency transactions. They actually say keep sufficient records. Pretty ambiguous, but um, for most people, that means keep a record of uh, what you purchased, the amount of coins or tokens that you purchased, the date that you purchased it, the value in US dollars, or if you sold it, um, all the same information. Very important to keep a very uh, strong detailed log of all of that. When you look at your 1040 at the end of the year, you file your own tax return, 
Um, there's not a whole lot of information that the IRS currently asked. If you look at the current years, the 2020 form, uh, there's a question actually showed up first on the 2019 form that basically asks, you'll see it here boxed in red, um, did you participate or acquire a financial interest in virtual currency? It's a yes or no question. And surprisingly, the taxpayers were not sure how to answer this. So the IRS has a list of FAQs on their website. And um, the question is posed, uh, what if I just bought virtual currency and didn't sell it? I just have it, I've been holding it. Um, you actually don't have to check yes to that question. Uh, so it seems a little bit contrary to what it's asking. Um, and I don't know actually, to be honest, what the, if you don't answer it correctly, if there is a repercussion, um, basically you just wanna be honest. And um, for all intents and purposes, I think this is just a data gathering exercise right now from the IRS uh, to see who, who has been involved in participating in virtual currency transactions. The next slide. Okay, so let's say you purchased some cryptocurrency and then you actually exchanged it or you, you sold it. Um, again, we know it's taxed as property. And so when you file your 1040 at the end of the year, um, you've been keeping good records. This actually gets reported on form 8949 and summarized on schedule D, uh, which is an attachment with your 1040. And again, for most people, it's gonna be a capital gain or loss and looking um, we, we'd be looking to net everything together and it, it would result in either a short-term or long-term uh, net capital gain or loss. And so the big takeaways I want you to take from here are keep really good records, know your basis and everything, be aware of how virtual currency is taxed because it is always changing. Um, but before you make a transaction, you should know what you're doing. Um, and if you don't, if you're not certain on how it's taxed, ask a tax advisor because the worst thing that can happen is you create something that generates some, an, uh, some income or a windfall that you're not expecting and um, will have to consequently pay tax on. So next slide. Okay, so tax considerations for businesses. I'm gonna bring up four use cases here and we can move on to the next slide. So the first use case is what if I have cryptocurrency and I actually wanna use this as an actual currency in place of um, let's say the US dollar. And let's say I wanna go out and purchase a good or a service and then pay for that with cryptocurrency. Um, well, as the current law stands, if we're taxing it as a piece of property, what that actually means is because you're giving up this property in exchange for a good or service, that, that creates a taxable exchange for you, a taxable event. You actually have to recognize gain or loss upon that exchange, um, meaning that it, it would roll up into your Schedule D uh, at the end of the year. And then if you're the one providing that good or service, you actually have a basis now in that cryptocurrency that you receive um, at the fair market value of um, what it was currently trading at that day, if that's available, or the good or service that you provided. And then the second scenario here, what if I'm an employer and I have employees asking to be paid with cryptocurrency? A few years ago, that might have sound a sounded a little more far-fetched, um, but it's actually becoming a lot more normal these days. Uh, there are a number of prominent, prominent uh, NFL athletes actually asking to be paid in cryptocurrency. Um, cryptocurrency, and, and it's very uh, becoming more normal. So if you're the employer, that means you have to go out and actually acquire the cryptocurrency and then you subsequently will exchange it to your employee for their services. And um, because of the volatility of the markets, you most likely will have a gain or loss upon that exchange, um, just simply because you bought it and then have to sell it. And it, it's still subject to the same W-2 and 1099 withholding requirements as, as if you were to pay with US dollar. So next slide. Okay, so third use case here, what if I'm a business and I see value in a blockchain solution? Um, and I wanna go out and actually implement that blockchain solution into my company. Um, you see benefits there. And the question I wanna raise is, is this like any other technology or software investment? And the correct answer is it depends. Uh, what we wanna look at is really the substance of, of what's happening. Um, substance over form, 
you're probably not going out and issuing a cryptocurrency that other people can invest in. Um, more than likely, you've got a distributed ledger. It's on a private chain and it's not really cryptocurrencies. You might have cryptographic keys, um, but we really wanna look at the substance of what you're investing in. Uh, it's very possible it could be considered internally developed software or, or an intangible asset um, rather than just strictly cryptocurrency. Again, looking at the substance of what you're investing in. And if there's a proprietary benefit to you, you could actually get, uh, you might qualify for the R&D tax credit, which is a, a very, very strong benefit to a company investing in proprietary software. So again, looking at substance, what are you investing in? And then the last use case here is what if I want to just go out and start a business that's involved in cryptocurrency? Um, well, there's a few very, very important considerations. Um, the first being look at your business structure, the entity, um, whether you want to be taxed as a, a C corporation or an S corporation or a partnership, LLC. Um, each one carries a different set of tax regulations and has a very large effect on um, the taxes at, at, for the business. The second thing is just the ownership and the equity structure. That's very important. It plays into the first point here. Um, you know, a lot of new startup companies will be all offering profits, interests, or um, some kind of restricted units. And there are very different tax consequences for each one of those things. And then the third point here is if you're going out and starting a business and that business is the ordinary course of business is actually to generate income from uh, cryptocurrency, whether that's mining, creating blockchain solutions. Um, again, the sole purpose is, of, of that business is that's what they're doing. Um, that's actually probably going to create ordinary income and expenses for you as opposed to a capital asset. So I know I flew through that. Um, and there's probably lots of questions at the end. We can bring those up if we have enough time, but that is the end of my presentation. So Brett, I'll like, take it from here. Perfect, thanks, Tim. And I think there's a few questions out there for you from the group. So um, have fun over the next 10 minutes answering a few of those. So thanks for, thanks for all that insight on tax. Um, so to kind of wrap this up today, I'm going to go through a few information technology considerations um, as it relates to cryptocurrency and the blockchain. So if you go to the next slide, please. So the, according to the Wall Street Journal, in recent years, there's actually been a loss of about $1.7 billion in U.S. dollars um, related to cryptocurrency. But the quick question is how and why? Well, very first and foremost, a big part of that is that, you know, at this point, cryptocurrency and the blockchain are still, still very much uh, experimental and speculative in nature. Um, you know, with the, it, it's a space that it continues to evolve. And we've seen this over the years from the split of currencies due to developer differences, or we've seen new coin offerings, so forth and so on. So that's, a, that's one part that makes it a target because it is experimental. There may be still gaps or, or in the processes or vulnerabilities that need to be identified or be, that are being exploited. I think secondly, you know, the, the theory in, in blockchain is that it's very secure, but the trading platforms and the actions by users is what also remains very vulnerable. And a few of these vulnerabilities are, are presented in, in the fact of, in, in the overall ecosystem and, and one being the mining itself. And so, you know, there's been malware out there that's serving or even leveraging compromised networks or machines um, for the use of mining activities. You know, a few examples of these, a supercomputer in Europe, um, actually, were actually taken over or compromised and used to mine. Uh, there was a botnet called Fritzfro that actually was out there that impacted enterprises and government services um, as far as using it to do mining activities. So maybe while not necessarily a direct impact on, on mining operations, you know, there are you know, leveraging of, of other computers and networks to, to perform mining activities. Another, you know, area is, is really the wallets and exchanges themselves. Um, you know, this could be that one, they are shut down or there's the stealing of currencies. You know, the methods are no different than what we see for any other technology today, such as social engineering. Um, with the amount of exchanges, as well as all the middle parties that start to get involved within these blockchains, um, you know, there's just a wide array of number of, of you know, situations that relate to this. As many of y'all might be familiar on this call, you know, Coinbase is one of the big, um, you know, exchanges out there, and they actually had an attempted attack of, of 280,000 
um, Bitcoin uh, that was tried that they tried to steal in 2020. Unfortunately for them, they were able to stop it, but that's not always the case. You know, there's been cases where the the coins are stolen themselves through hot wallets, or essentially if you own if you have a wallet that's connected to the internet, or from exchanges, whether it was Eaterbase or Two Together or KuCoin, CoinCheck, so forth and so on. You know, those actually had situations where vulnerability. Um, exposed uh, at least some of the customers within the market. We've also seen it actually close changes, exchanges itself uh, through cyber attacks in which all the coins were stolen, such as Altbit. So a few examples there. You've also got hacking groups that are using, that are exploiting and targeting exchanges to steal cryptocurrency, as well as they're also using ransomware with cryptocurrency as the payment, you know, as a method for releasing, you know, whatever's been encrypted. And finally, I think that you know, there's just a general disruption to the market, that there's, a, there's, there's, there's competing resources and, and you have to look out for actors just looking to disrupt the market as well. I think another area that makes cryptocurrency a target is just you know, that intention or, or desire of, of your internal employees you know, misusing assets um, for the purposes of mining. There's some examples out there with the Russian Nuclear Center, or you've got the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. In both these cases, there was employees that misused the resources to, to do their own mining. So all of a sudden you have an uptick in some type of resource utilization. You know, is it because we're actually utilizing it for business intention or is it expanded elsewhere um, for uses such as uh, mining itself? And then I think, you know, one of them, which is not necessarily an IT concern per se, is just, you know, the general validity of the coin offerings out there. Um, you know, there was news recently, I think even in the past week, related to Litecoin and Walmart, um, in which they said there was an established relationship that was false. Um, what that does is create that, that impact to the market of people getting really excited because of maybe a trusted name such as Walmart. Maybe this is a coin I want to invest in. But then you also have a coin out there that was called OneCoin. And this one was promoted as being better than Bitcoin. However, when, you know, push came to shove, at the end of the day, it ended up being not even utilizing blockchain technology. And so it's really understanding, you know, is, is this something that I can truly invest in? It's got a, a, a worldwide presence and, and miners and, and developers that are really involved in the continued vitality of the, the coin itself. And then as I mentioned at the very beginning, right, user behaviors is a big part of this. You know, it's whether it's user's behavior of not necessarily knowing the risk of cybersecurity, of cybersecurity around cryptocurrency, the ecosystem itself, the exposure to risk, you know, the volatility, their, their, their own use of passwords and private keys. All this can actually, you know, be a risk to the market and may become a target and, and gets back into that social engineering and other ways that they may be impacted. Next slide, please. So you're likely asking, well, what do I do about this? Well, I think first and foremost is you need to research the market and, and the investments in the platforms. You know, digital uh, currency is decentralized and there's no regulatory body um, other than the chain itself. And the exchanges themselves are not necessarily regulated consistently. And so with that, it's really researching the exchanges that you use, the offerings that you're investing in and making sure that they're sound or as sound as you can make sense of. I think secondly, you know, because there is no governing body is, is applying some types of framework, right? Um, and assessing your own company as well as the third parties that you're using or utilizing um, is assessing you know, their adoption of security frameworks, uh, whether that's in this framework or some other framework out there. I think that we'll eventually see some type of adoption of security framework around blockchain technology, as well as around cryptocurrencies, but assessing the security posture of your own organization is very important. I think you, you know, private key protection, encryption, and cold wallets is another area. Um, you, know, you should look at adoption of process controls around private key protection, encryption, using essentially um, wallets that are not necessarily connected to the internet. You know, you know, it's, it, examples of this is not storing your private key on a PC like any other file. If your computer's compromised, then so is the coin. You know, a key that is lost forever is gone. It's not like there's a locksmith out there that can help you come rescue it. Um, I mean, there's cases with, with that, that there's individuals that can recover, but it's not always the case and it's not a guarantee. And so we don't have those same, um, you know, uh, stop gaps that we do in, say, the financial markets. And then consider using things like a hardware wallet, essentially a USB you're, you're putting a private code on, as well as applying your general treasury controls as an organization, you know, lock boxes, so forth, when you're storing those private keys. When we look at phishing education and testing, a key part of this is that, you know, 
are your, your some of your your own your own faults may be the individuals themselves that are managing the the, the primary the uh, the private keys or the, the technology itself used for trading. Um, phishing scams are a day to day thing that companies work, deal with, and as part of that, you know, cryptocurrency is no different. And so that could be targeted emails, ad clicking, you know, blackmail. There's so many different ways in which people are targeted. And with the trail of transactions that we have on the blockchain, while they are not necessarily identifiable, there is some type of trail that someone may trace back to you, understanding that you are a target in these situations. And so, you know, putting uh, controls in place around educating the user base um, from a phishing standpoint may be a good deterrent um, to uh, potential exposure. And I think that it continues on to that credentials restriction and monitoring. When we look at credential restricting, who has access, how are we protecting those keys, um, how are we protecting sensitive accounts, how are we monitoring those system accounts and so forth. From a system performance monitoring, I think that this is not necessarily as much around, I think as if you're a mining organization, maybe you're, you're, that's your day-to-day -day job is monitoring the effectiveness of the mining operation, but it's also looking at monitoring system performance as just a general organization in which may is a resource being used for uh, not its intended use. So in this case, we're talking about you know, a mining activity. And then I think you know, in general, I, I recommend that you just remain controls minded, whether that's looking at network monitoring, physical security, vulnerability management, so forth and so on. Next slide, please. So I, I, you know, it would be best for me to mention that it's not always all, all about security. So there are a lot of other IT risks within blockchain and, and as well as the crypto market. Now, one of those is really around the procurement. So if you're a mining organization, it's, it's really the, the market you have to procure the, the assets you need in those GPUs. So essentially what's the purchasing process, especially if you're moving from say a China operations to a US operation, how are you dealing with shipping, customs, transportation, so forth and so on, and your ability to scale up. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're still in times of COVID, supply chains are limited. And so are you able to get the, the, the resources that you need to continue those operations? I think from a uh, you know, third party relationships, I mentioned that, but really understanding your third parties, um, what do they do and how are they mitigating their own risk? And then you know, this could include everything from the exchanges themselves, it could be um, procurement channels, it could be cloud resources, it really goes on and on. And I think from that's the asset management piece. Once you've done that procurement, that you actually start to understand what am I logging from a GPU perspective as far as my assets, how am I maintaining them, decommissioning them, monitoring them, and that overall inventory management and risk around that. And then the final piece is around utilization, our power usage. And, and we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about um, ESG here in just a second. But essentially, there's a lot of pressure on the amount of impact it has on the environment um, as it relates to mining. And so there's some risk around the utilization of these GPUs, power usage to do mining operations. The diagram on the right, I'll be very brief on it. But these are just some other risks that are out there. Um, you know, these things are include human resource risk, investment strategies, you know, what coin, you can do Bitcoin, altcoin, so forth and so on. Regulations, which we've talked a little bit about, and, and in general, the environmental and social issues. So going to my last slide, you know, ESG is a hot topic in the marketplace right now. Um, so environmental, social and governance reporting, while I'm not going to cover it in there, you know, I do encourage you to go to our website to get more information around ESG. But in general, you have stakeholders, investors that are really looking at the, at, at, you know, the environmental side, the social ability of, this, of, of the risk as it relates to um, cryptocurrencies. Everything from Elon Musk saying, hey, I'm going to get out of a certain currency because you know, it's using such a large amount of our resources, our precious resources. And then you know, uh, there's strategies that are related to certain coins that are really looking at using, say, solar energy or um, hydro energy or something that's a little bit more safe for the environment. But I think that social responsibility and having sustainable practices is really important topic as it relates to cryptocurrency and, and, and really the blockchain in general. And so as we go through that, we'll end on our final polling questions and I'll open it up for questions if we have a little bit of time. So based on the knowledge gained from this presentation, so what concerns you most about cryptocurrency? We'll give you all about a minute from that, but I think with that, Kay, I'm happy to hand it back over to you and we can open it up to questions or, or wrap up as we need to. Yes, uh, while everyone's doing that last polling question, um, you know, if we can definitely stay on a little bit longer. Um, Brittany, did, 
did any of those that are in the q and A? I I think there's six questions that are in the Q&A function. Did any of those get answered? Because I know a lot of those in the chat have been getting answered. Um, I'd love for you to read off any in there that you think. Uh... Sure, I'm try I was trying to keep up with what they answered in the chat, but I don't think this one was answered. It was very early. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Um, uh, blockchains are amazing in all respects, except for the amount of energy required to mine them, which I think Brett just kind of touched on. How does this play out with more and more energy being used worldwide? How does this end for blockchains? As I can't imagine uh, this having long-term future given power usage. So I'll, I'll try to address that. I mean, I, I think that that's one of the, the biggest issues facing cryptocurrency today and, and, and that there's a lot of investment strategies that are looking at this. I mean, I think that you're seeing the market change because of the actual strategies around the, tech, the amount of energy that are being used. I think locations is a big part of that. Um, I think that people are, that organizations that are, that are what I would call bigger mining operations are starting to look at those strategies of our, where we go, what energy are we using, how is it sustainable, are we, are, or you know, are they renewable resources and so on? Um, so I don't know if I directly answered it, but it is it is a hot topic, especially right now, because there is such an increase in the amount of energy being used. Um, and you know, a lot of stories out of China related to that, and that was a big big component of, among many other things of why there's there's definitely a change in policy over there. Uh, but I think we'll see that that change. Um, you've also got the staking component of this that people are looking instead of necessarily owning the entire ledger that we're going to reevaluate and how those those blockchains are being used and utilized um, so that we're using less energy for you to be the essentially the one that owns that uh, th that block so I uh, hope I answered that question we can go back to others okay all right so we have a couple others well, answering yes in the 1040 covering the crypto question raised audit probability. Gosh, my fingers over here, they're burning. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of tax questions as I'm sure most people, uh, it's not surprising to me because I'm sure most people have a lot of questions. Um, I honestly don't know if it will raise audit probability. I, I don't think so. Um, and honestly, at the moment, the IRS is pretty strapped for resources, and they probably don't care about the average person um, answering no and when they should answer yes or vice versa. And I think they're trying to go after the bigger fish at the moment, uh, especially businesses who uh, have offshore operations. Um, so I would not be too concerned if you didn't answer that correct question correctly. Again, as I mentioned, I think it's more of a data gathering exercise for these, these last two years. Okay. Um, trying to go through these. Um, okay. What is the tax treatment for individuals compensated in cryptocurrency? Yeah, so I briefly touched on that. If you're the one being paid in cryptocurrency, it is actually ordinary income to you as if um, you were paid in US dollar. Um, the the key there or the catch is that you now have this asset. Um, so you probably get a W-2 and it would be reporting wages to you as normal, except you now got this asset. And then if you subsequently dispose of that cryptocurrency, um, that would create a probably a, a capital event for you. Okay. Does anyone see a potential case to claim depletion on mining cryptocurrencies? for claiming yeah. some sort of depletion. Is that Robert Crowdy's question? I think it was. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. As of now, I don't, I don't think so. Um, although it would make sense if you had a big mining operation, uh, especially if you're using uh, energy uh, derived from oil and gas. I've, I've had a number of clients actually get pitched um, opportunities to use their excess gas to power uh, Bitcoin mining operations. Um, as of now, I don't think so, but it, it would be an interesting position to take. Okay. Will crypto mining by individuals be classified as a hobby business by the IRS? Also, will each coin fraction earned by miners establish its own basis 
for further profit loss accounting? Okay, so there's really two questions there. The first one is the classic hobby versus business rule. Um, if it were up to anyone, they would have business treatment because you can actually take ordinary losses versus the hobby loss. Hobby uh, rules are a lot more restrictive. Um, you would again would look at the substance of what you're doing and, and actually your involvement in activity and most likely it would fall under the hobby rules. And then the second question, um, can you repeat that? Um, I think it's gone. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry about the second question. Oh, oh, sorry. Also, will each coin fraction earned by miners establish its own basis for further profit loss accounting? Um, great question. So if you're mining, um, I didn't touch on this in the slides, but if you are mining cryptocurrency and you receive, you know, those awards, um, you're actually going to report that probably as uh, as ordinary income. And because you're reporting that as ordinary, that, that is your new basis in the coin or the tokens that you receive. Okay. Um, another one for, this a longer one, for corporate treasurers that allocate funds to a crypto asset or held to maturity investments, will these gains loss on disposition be commingled with other uh, 1221 gain loss for reporting purposes? So there's a bit of, of a mix of financial accounting questions uh, versus actual tax question in there. Um, the short answer is yes for tax purposes, but the, the Becky, I mean, you can speak to the financial accounting piece. Yeah, um, so I actually answered this one in the in the question and answer box, um, but happy to answer it here too. Um, so like everything um, from an auditor standpoint, it depends on materiality. So um, if it's if it's a significant component of the gains and losses, I would suggest breaking it out separately. Um, it's going to be um, a line item that is is reported as part of the income from operations before taxes. Um, so certainly if it's material, um, you'd probably need to break it out out there as a separate component of gains and losses. Um, and following suit with that, yes, um, the disclosures would need to speak to that as well if it is material. And then cash flow would be dependent upon um, what you are utilizing that, that crypto for. Um, so if it's for investment purposes, it would likely be in the investing um, section of the cash flow. Okay, thank you all. I was just gonna say, um, we are gonna send out an evaluation. And with that, Brittany, aren't we going to send a copy of the presentation? Yes, that will be included. Okay, and then um, hopefully most of the questions have been answered in the chat feature, but we're happy to, if we've missed some, uh, you know, try to get those answered for you. Absolutely. So I just wanna thank everyone for coming today and thank you for all of our speakers from Weaver. And uh, I think that's a wrap. So thank you all.